Greetings, jerks. Boy, oh boy, don't you all look eager today with your gaping mouths all tonguing the air, desperate for a few drops of my news? Well, get ready, schmucks, because here's some news. I am really sorry about coming in so hot just now, just to level with you. I recently came into a bunch of money, and I guess I'm just, I'm just feeling a tad bit cocky, you know? It's kind of wild how just a little bit of wealth does that. Like, I spat on my neighbor's cat this morning. Don't worry, the cat loved it, but this got me thinking. Hey now, have you ever noticed that rich people seem to be a little... off? And no, I'm not just talking about this guy. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of talking about that guy, but not just that guy. Because the Duke of Interesting Looking Into It isn't the only rich person who has taken the word eccentric to an extremely unsettling level. And not just one or two of them, but most rich people, regardless of their political views or occupation, everything from Peter Thiel wanting to build his own floating libertarian island to Gwyneth Paltrow justifying the sale of psychic vampire repellent. Nearly every time a rich person shares their daily schedule or personal diet, it reads like an alien terrorist's manifesto. There are entire industries like pet cloning that exist because of weird rich people. Or just look at any auction where something like John Lennon's tooth or a banana taped to a wall sells for way more money than it's worth. Or heck, just look at everything Nicolas Cage has purchased. Sometimes people like to credit their behavior to being geniuses, but I think most of us realize that's not the case. Because it doesn't matter who the rich person is, they inevitably say or do something super messed up. And they've been doing it since forever. It's said that Henry Ford ate literal grass sandwiches. There's a terrible horror movie based on the time a rich widow built a funhouse to hide from ghosts. Just look up any history on old nobility. You'll crack open a pinata of brain spiders. And of course, this is why we have the extremely old trope of the bizarre, often evil rich person. Charles Foster Kane, Mr. Fish Odor, any Bond villain, Scrooge, or Scrooge's anamorph duck form. That dragon literally sitting on gold in the hobbit christian gray mr burns of course and don't you sit there and tell me that bruce wayne isn't a messed up guy but none of that would really matter except these same people also hold a huge amount of political power because they're not the fictional characters they're real people they influence the politicians that make our laws they own the companies we work for and control the industries we need to provide us with essential living standards and so as a newly rich person myself, I think this concerns me even more. What can I do to avoid becoming a villain? Spit on fewer cats? Spit on the same number of cats, but less. Bah! Not gonna happen. Sorry. Anyway, today we ask an important question to which you already know the answer. Are rich people okay? Seriously now, are they? If only they were just playful eccentrics, a well-dressed foppish monocle wearer, perhaps a, an anthropomorphic legume. But there's a lot of evidence out there that the wealthier you get, the less likely you are to find common ground with your fellow human beings, which could suggest that maybe they shouldn't have any power over their fellow human beings. To put it simply, rich people can be real f up gnarled dicks. They tend to be worse tippers, though they self-report being better tippers. They gave less of their money to charitable causes during the Great Recession than others. They have a tendency to assume they can skirt around the law or get away with not paying people for services. The greater the income inequality where they live, the less likely they are to be generous and giving. I could go on. So I will. One study found that drivers of more expensive cars were less likely than others to stop for pedestrians at crosswalks and were generally just more reckless as drivers. And here's a story that they were more likely than non-rich people to take candy that they were specifically told would otherwise go to children. Yes, literally, Mr. Burns. He said, drop it. <laughs> Those are just studies, mind you. Science trash. Who needs it? Patui! Take that, you cat! But there are loads of examples of rich people proving them right. For example, 
paying hefty sums and bribes to make sure their children can get accepted to elite universities, often with fake test scores or as fake athletic recruits. That's right, when you're lost out there and you're all alone, a light is waiting to give a $500,000 bribe from your semi-famous mom. The ringleader of that scheme said he helped 750 wealthy families get their kids into college, mostly for kids that wouldn't have been accepted otherwise, and some of whom didn't want to go at all. There's another discussion to be had about the actual value of attending elite universities, but those are 750 plus spots that could have gone to students who actually worked for that opportunity, or don't have that opportunity, or at the very least, wanted to go. And not only does it dissolve any notion that our society is a meritocracy, but it shows that wealthy people truly think they deserve things because they are wealthy and don't care about how their actions impact others. You might recall that news story where a rich teenager drove drunk and killed four people before his lawyers said he had affluenza which is apparently a psychological condition from being raised in wealth and privilege. That term was dismissed as pseudoscientific and having no basis in psychology. But as it turns out, science does have a lot to say about how being wealthy alters the way you think. Or as this news scientist will editorialize, fucks up your brain. There are statistics showing that rich kids are more likely to experience substance abuse, and just as likely as poor kids to commit crimes. As adults, they will also drink much more often and recklessly than most. But what's unique is that the crimes they commit are wildly different. While poorer kids in the inner city tend to get busted for things like carrying weapons, often for self-defense reasons, rich kids mainly get in trouble for stealing from their peers and parents. I'm not saying that poor people can't also steal from their parents, and if you're poor and watching, you have my permission. But the differences are interesting in that rich people seem to commit crimes that they either think they'll get away with or just, they don't, just don't care if they do. Often it shows a disrespect for their immediate surroundings stealing from the people directly around them, or, of course, massive tax evasion, or the fact that rich people are more likely to say they drive over the speed limit. After all, what do they care if the penalty is a fine? That's probably why there's at least one study showing that rich people actually tend to shoplift more than non-rich folk. There's often an inherent disregard for others on a massive scale. For example, the endless stories of wealthy homeowners who've tried to illegally block access to public beaches near their homes. You know, because those public beaches are, are theirs now, I guess. No looky-loos! The owner of this home on Pacific Coast Highway has been fined $4.2 million for intentionally blocking access to the beach. And that was a compounded penalty over many years of not complying. The public on a public beach? Yuckies, patooey, I wish everything was a cat that I could spit on. And while the homeowners may have legitimate gripes about litter or noise, it's the goddamn motherfucking beach. You decided to buy a house there, my fellow rich person. You can't build yourself a house next to Central Park and then get upset when you go outside and see old men playing chess, even if it's Magneto. California's earliest state laws said the area between the water line and the mean high tide line is public. So you can't block access to it or keep it all to yourself, even if you own the area surrounding it. Voters enshrined that into the state constitution in 1972. But that hasn't stopped people from putting up phony, no trespassing signs, or even hiring private security guards to try and kick people out. Here's a story about one rich dip who bought 89 acres of land near San Francisco for $30 million, and then locked the public access gate to the local beach. He even posted security guards and signs that read, beach closed, Keep out! And the fight over that beach has continued for more than a decade, leading the State Coastal Commission to sue in 2020. They're demanding that the rich dip either apply for a permit to change access to that beach, or open that road and charge no more than $2 for parking. But the wild part, he doesn't even give a shit. He said he regrets buying the property and hasn't spent a single night there, and that he's only waging a decades-long legal battle on principle, since he doesn't want to be forced to run an unprofitable parking business. He doesn't even want to win. 
In 2018, he told the New York Times, quote, if I were to ever win in the Supreme Court, I'd be depressed about it. I support the Coastal Act. I don't want to weaken it by winning, but property rights are even more important. So just to recap, this rich dip purchased a bunch of land around a public beach, closed the road access to that beach, doesn't use the property he bought, and is acting really put upon by all the people telling him he can't just close a public beach, but also thinks it would be bad if he won his battle to close down the public beach. And I don't know, but I think maybe it's a therapist you need instead of a lawyer. But I can't stress enough how not a fluke this one story is. If you combined all the public land in America that's currently inaccessible because it's surrounded by private property, it would be the size of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Connecticut put together. At 15 million acres, that would make it the largest national park in the country. We'd call it Grand Prick National Park or Dildo Stone, Dildo Simony, whatever you want to call it like that. The wealthy are buying up huge chunks of America to keep the public out and further isolate themselves. And the more resources they have, the more they tend to take. Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison, who's worth more than $100 billion, bought the sixth largest Hawaiian island and then immediately started making life for the island's 3,000 inhabitants absolutely miserable. He now gives most small businesses only 30-day commercial leases and forced many generations-long locals to leave after cutting off their revenue streams. Essentially, if you still live there, Ellison is likely both your boss and your landlord. Something to look forward to for all you Texas residents and Tesla employees. And that's kind of on par for the ultra-rich, to use a golf metaphor they'll understand. To quote Brooke Harrington, a sociologist who studied for years as a wealth manager, the lives of the richest people in the world are so different from those of the rest of us, it's almost literally unimaginable. National borders are nothing to them. They might as well not exist. The laws are nothing to them. They might as well not exist. One wealth manager told her that the ultra-rich believe that they are descended from the pharaohs and that they were destined to inherit the earth. I mean, pharaohs were also pieces of shit so that actually might check out. And of course, none of what you're hearing is surprising. Again, behavior like this is why we have all those rich people stereotypes. I may be a rich guy now, but I still remember what it meant to be poor and to know that the wealthy are a leech on our society. And yet, quite ironically, we've also designed this system to give them the most power and therefore allowed them to get away with the most crimes. Huge systemic crimes. Crimes we haven't even talked about, like how companies can just steal from their employees and get away with it. In 2017, and in just California, wage theft totaled to over $320 million. Nationally, that number is $8 billion. Compare that to shoplifting or robbery losses, and you have to wonder why the nightly news is not constantly covering the massive epidemic of rich bosses stealing from their employees. But again, we know this. So the question really isn't, are rich people okay? But actually, why are rich people not okay? And when we come back, we're going to look into that answer. I need to know, like, really bad. After all, I'm rich now. See? Trust your eyes, folks. That is an actual Beanie Baby. Last time I saw one of these, everyone was scrambling for them because they'd be worth millions in the future. And they said that in the past, making now the future. And would the past lie? I think not. Found this one in some idiot stroller just sitting there between two fleshy arm-like things. Like, I know I say that money is fake all the time, which is why I don't really pay attention to how much things cost or my own finances, but this has to be like worth a lot someone needs to make a movie about this find my life is going to change starting now well at least until after this ad break ah oh, ad breaks why do i even need them i'm rich Hello, sweet consumers. I'm Cody, and I want to tell you about AG1 by Athletic Greens. It's a vitamin drink for your mouth. 
I gave AG1 a try because I wanted to stay strong and healthy so I could fight ghosts. You know how sometimes you hear weird noises in your walls at night and a bunch of your stuff goes missing? Those are called ghost thieves and they're no laughing matter. I take AG1 because I don't always have time to eat a full meal when I'm staying up late protecting my belongings. It takes everything you'd get in a multivitamin and puts it all in one drink. This is a drink. -a. Capsule devoured. Eh, a little more. Capsule devoured. Excellent. Yummers, it comes with this cool travel cup so you can drink AG1 even when you're walking the perimeter of your home with a flashlight and a vial of holy water. Heaven is filled with stolen goods, you know? Don't trust the dead. So if you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash more news. That's athleticgreens.com slash more news. Protect your belongings from ghosts with this vitamin drink and stuff. Hello, beautiful money haver. I'm Katie and I want to tell you about ExpressVPN. You know, ever since I watched the films Parasite and Inside Man, I've become obsessed with sneaking into people's homes and hiding in their walls and taking their stuff. There's no law against it. Sadly, Netflix doesn't carry those two movies unless you live in the UK, but... Unsadly, I use ExpressVPN to change where Netflix and other streaming services think I'm located. That way I can be inspired by way more movies and shows where people hide in walls. Sometimes I make ghost sounds while in the walls. <laughs> Ever see the black phone? You can watch it on Netflix if you're in Canada. Or if you have ExpressVPN, they have access to servers in 94 different countries, plus blazing fast streaming speeds, and it even works on all your devices. So get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash more news. Don't forget to use my link at expressvpn.com slash more news to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free, you little creeper. Hey, we're back. Gonna just put this beanie baby away. Don't want anyone to steal it before I get it to an appraiser. Anyway, money. It's a gas. In that it makes people explode. After all, if you recall from before the ads, it's very clear that having money doesn't make you a model citizen. And it's not hard to speculate why. People with lots of money exert more political control, own more stuff, and generally have an easier time going about their day giving them more material and institutional power than those who don't. And that power dynamic is what seems to melt the rich person brain like a craft single in a microwave, a simile that a rich person would not understand. For starters, one 2009 study found that people with a lot of wealth and power tend to think they have more personal control over life outcomes than they really do, even when the outcome is completely random. The researchers asked a variety of people to predict a dice roll but found that people in high power positions uniformly wanted to roll the dice themselves instead of letting someone else do it for them. People in neutral or low power positions were more likely to be okay letting someone else roll the dice because it's a, it's a, it's a dice roll. And unless you're Danny Ocean, you can't influence what happens. Essentially, being rich and powerful leads you to overestimate your own abilities, even in things that are 100% based on luck or random chance. Since these people credit themselves with high performance, it's only natural that they think that their own special touch is going to be more valuable than that of others. It's why they deny other people's lived experiences that conflict with their own viewpoints. After all, they have all the money, so they must be right. Another study from 2019 confirmed this result. People from higher social classes were more likely to express overconfidence in their performance in a series of basic cognitive tests, even though they performed at about the same level as everyone else. But what's really wild and kind of explains a lot about certain, um, let's call them suck-ups to, uh, let's 
call him Elon Musk, is that independent observers in that study also rated those people as more competent than others, despite knowing that they didn't perform any better in the tests. Their overconfidence was seen as evidence of competence to the observers, and so, as the researchers speculated, this attitude might be partially why the rich tend to stay that way. In other words, this money disease also affects people without money, who see rich people as somehow more deserving of their status. Way to victim blame peer-reviewed study by the American Psychological Association. At any rate, it's this overconfidence and disregard for the help of others that leads to narcissistic and antisocial behavior. In one of the games, we actually rigged a computer so that die rolls over a certain score were impossible. You couldn't get above 12 in this game, and yet, the richer you were, the more likely you were to cheat in this game to earn credits toward a $50 cash prize, sometimes by three to four times as much. Wow, a TED Talk? How quaint. That's Paul Piff, cool name haver and a psychological science researcher who's behind a few of the studies we're talking about in this episode. Mr. PP has highlighted some of the more negative tendencies of the wealthy in his research. Specifically, that people with lots of money and high social status are more likely to cheat, exhibit unethical behavior in business, and lie in negotiations. They have a great ability to morally justify those unethical decisions in their own minds. Piff argues that wealthy people simply have fewer constraints that would hinder their ability to act this way, and that their isolation from others makes it so they don't have to think about the consequences of their actions. They've literally been able to buy their way out of having to worry about what other people think. In one experiment where Piff gave individuals $10 and asked them how much they'd like to share with a total stranger, poor people gave an average of 44% more than the affluent. When those poor people picture a stranger, they're probably thinking about someone like them, also known as someone who could also use the money. But when rich people picture a stranger, they aren't thinking about a gross poor person at all. They're much more likely picturing one of their peers, some fucking rich person, possibly wearing a top hat and orgy mask. And that perverted freak certainly doesn't need that 10 bucks. And this ungenerous behavior is a big symptom of social isolation. Further research bears this out. A 2016 study found that wealthier people literally look at other people less often while walking down the street and, perhaps as a result, have a harder time identifying changes in facial expressions in photos. The researchers say that the faces of others hold less motivational relevance among the wealthy, which is a, a nice academic way of saying that you don't f***ing matter to them because they don't value you. It's almost as if, in their eyes, the rest of us are, what could the term be? Uh, what, are, what do they see us as? What, what would it be? It would be non-playable characters in a video game. Hmm, that seem, seems like the kind of view a person who perhaps shouldn't be in charge of a social media company would have. Oh, also, speaking of divorced guys obsessed with Twitter, rich people are f***ing miserable. I know it's hard to care much, but it's important to note that despite being overconfident narcissists who, again, literally steal candy from babies, they aren't actually happy at all. The old adage that money can't buy you happiness is, let's say, a little true. Because if you're poor and don't have your basic needs met, money will absolutely buy happiness. But after a certain point, that money does stop helping. One study from Purdue University estimated this level to be around $95,000 a year. But above that, more money tends to equal less life satisfaction. I'm honestly not sure how accurate that is or if there's a quantifiable number here. But you get the general idea. It's not really that money buys happiness. It's that money removes stressors of survival that cause unhappiness. There is a point for everyone where the money to happy ratio levels out. It's of course hard to imagine because the people often pointing this out are, you know, rich. I thought that success was all I needed. That's what was gonna bring the happiness, buying my mom a house. When those things came, the, the happiness wasn't there. Thank you, fellow rich person, Jay Cole. Achieving a high level of wealth or status does a couple of things to the human brain that cause less happiness. That social isolation we mentioned earlier doesn't just lead to a lack of compassion and empathy for others, but it also isolates them from their own community. 
rich people overall spend less time socializing than lower income people. But when they do, they have to hang out with other rich people, which sounds honestly terrible. Like, imagine having to play code names with this guy. And just like you and your friends competing over who's better at video games or who can fit the most bottle caps in their mouth, this creates a feedback loop of rich people only comparing themselves to other rich people. It's why some of these depressing assholes have spent the last few decades competing to own the biggest yacht. Or, one imagines, trying to see who can fit the most golden bottle caps in their mouths. It's Warren Buffett, obviously. No better example is the recent article in The Cut about the Fleischman effect, named after the classic DC Comics character Fleischman. Fleshman. Flesh, the Fleshman. It details the struggle of America's moderately affluent who don't feel quite rich enough. Quote, Since leaving New York, Beth has found herself in tears at least once a week. She makes $300,000 a year, more than she's ever earned in her life, but she's running out of minutes in the day to squeeze out more dollars. How do I make the $700,000 that I'm going to need to send my daughter to private school or do the renovation in the attic so I can turn it into the master suite so I can have a tub and so I can have one thing I enjoy in my life, she says. Not surprisingly, Beth isn't her real name. The people interviewed for that article seem to understand that complaining about their lives is like complaining about being given too much free weed at Coachella, or just being given too much free weed, period. But even all that free weed, or I guess an attic tub, won't make her any happier. Once people achieve a certain status, they become terrified of losing it, and will expend way more effort trying to maintain their status. For example, I have already hired an armed guard to watch my beanie baby, and I will not sleep until that guard arrives. Don't think I can't feel all your coveting eyes. I feel them. They're pointed at the beanie baby. And so this might explain why rich people don't actually feel rich. Like how 35% of millionaires say that retirement is going to take a miracle, or why people who make six figures sometimes say that they're living paycheck to paycheck. Here's a fun eyesore from something called FinancialSamurai.com, attempting to explain why someone making $400,000 a year isn't actually wealthy. The rationale is that a higher earner in a big city doesn't have that much money left over. After they buy all the things that rich people spend their money on. Fancy private schools, a $1.6 million house, one of them Squid Games tickets, and three vacations a year. It's hard to feel rich when you constantly have to spend all your money trying to be rich. It's funny how it's always the poor that are blamed for their spending choices, because it sure appears like the wealthy are terrible with their money. So weird and funny, that is. Ha 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 ha. In fact, overall, it seems that rich people can't help but develop these, let's call them symptoms. You overestimate your own abilities. Think less about the feelings of others, get increasingly isolated, and yet you still want more. We can even circle back to that Paul Piff TED Talk to see how all these elements come together, quite perfectly, in a game of Monopoly rigged to favor one player over the other. The rich player started to move around the board louder, literally smacking the board with their piece as he went around. Mm. We were more likely to see Signs of dominance and nonverbal signs of display, uh, displays of power and celebration among the rich players. P Dog brought in more than 100 strangers and then paired them off to play one on one. But in each group, one of the players was randomly selected to start with double the money, roll two dice instead of one per turn, and get twice as much every time they passed go. Monopoly, a socialist game intended to demonstrate the ills of capitalism, already makes for an insufferable afternoon under the normal rules. So as you would expect, this very quickly became a bloodbath, and the rich players acted accordingly. They became boastful, disregarding the feelings of the strangers sitting across from them, and even started taking more pretzels from a communal bowl placed on the table. After the game was over, the winners were asked why they thought they won, and incredibly, very few of them mentioned the coin flip. Instead, they talked about their own strategies, the shrewd moves they had made to buy properties and take control of the game. It's almost as if they had a sort of amnesia about the obvious head start they'd been given. Maybe because acknowledging that would make them feel bad. 
We see this in more areas than just money. People getting downright offended at the accusation that they were given special treatment. And of course, one very specific industry comes to mind. There is no prerequisite to be in this business. Hustle, talent, timing, hard work. Boom. And if you have the acumen of a, a film degree and a history of film, does that help you? Of course. But it's not the requirement. Hustle, talent, timing, hard work, boom, that's all it takes. And then secondarily, of course, the acumen of a film degree and a history of film. And maybe history of film is her reference to the fact that her mom was Janet Lee and her father was Tony Curtis. Look, I take no pleasure in going after Jamie Lee Curtis. I like Jamie Lee Curtis. She was in Drowning Mona for Pete's sake. And I'm told a lot of other films too, we have our researchers on it and we'll hopefully confirm soon, but come on. When she got her big break in Halloween, oh, see, they confirmed she was in other movies. When she got got her big break in Halloween, the producer and co-writer specifically said that they cast her, at least in part, because her mom was in Psycho. They wanted the publicity. Of course they did. And of course, Jamie Lee would embrace that connection as well. Nobody is saying she's not talented and didn't work hard. But this is a great example of how the Monopoly study manifests in the real world. People have success and then convince themselves that it was almost exclusively their own talent and hard work, and they downplay the massive leg up they got by being the offspring of Hollywood royalty. She got to roll extra dice and got double the money, and you can tell it causes her anguish to acknowledge that. Because she said that it does. And that's what the Monopoly experiment shows, that this can happen to anyone, even the star of the hit film Drowning Mona. That experiment has been recreated in several different contexts around the world, by the way, all with similar results. And so, again, this isn't a problem with rich people so much as, like, with a species? It's not in their blood or anything. It's a problem that can affect anyone under the right conditions. If you get a lot of money and success, your world changes in a certain way that makes you lack empathy, become lonely, grow jealous of others, develop delusions about your own accomplishments, and lose so much impulse control and consequences that you will steal candy from a baby. You literally become Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. Or I guess if you're a younger rich person, you become Hank Scorpio, a guy who pretends to care about his employees but really makes things all about himself, exploiting others to further his own diabolical plans, possibly flamethrower themed. Glad you made that connection to Elon. Maybe it's bad that you are the villain in a TV cartoon. Very self-aware. As an aside, boy, The Simpsons really got rich people's numbers, huh? They really, they really just nailed it. Anyway, we're going to get into the consequences of all of this after the ad break, because as we mentioned at the top of this video, not only are these people very troubled, but they also have a lot of influence over the world. And that seems dangerous. It's dangerous for people who clearly don't like other people to have influence over everybody's lives. And it seems like there's a really unhealthy cycle, perhaps a spiral, that makes it extremely hard to break this pattern. Rich people influence politics and run companies, which makes them richer. Poor people aspire to be rich, perhaps to change the system themselves. And if they actually got rich, they would just succumb to the system as well. I mean, except for me who will not let my Beanie Baby wealth, which I earned, change me. I earned that, okay? My expert eyes spotted the Beanie Baby and dexterously liberated it from a stroller. You can't teach that in school. You have to learn it in the real world, on the streets, where you take the thing from the stroller. Anyway, ads first, then we'll talk more about my success. Hey, it's Cody from the show you're watching. I'm here to tell you about Next Evo Naturals. You know, Life happens very fast. One moment you're creeping through your house, hunting ghost thieves, and then next thing you know, you're slipping on a bunch of marbles and then waking up hours later with your shoes missing and a bunch of your hair shaved off. With Next Evo CBD products, I'm able to reduce my daily stress so I can actually sleep. And not just marble slipping sleep, real human sleep. Listen here, Mac. Only Next Evo uses Smart Zorb CBD, which they claim has 30 times better absorption than other CBD products. And between their triple action CBD sleep and stress CBD complex, they can handle a variety of needs. Heck. 
Maybe they'll invent a CBD that helps fight ghosts that leave marbles in your kitchen and then steal your shoes and hair when you slip on it and hit your head on the sink. So upgrade your CBD. Go to nextevo.com slash more news to get 20% off your first order of $40 or more. That's 20% off $40 or more at nextevo.com slash more news. Hello, it is me, Katie, a business genius. Along with this show you're watching, I run a little side hustle selling slightly used shoes and hair to weirdos on the internet. And thanks to a secret special technique I use to acquire my products, it's almost all profit. But I would be lying if I said it was all because of my hard work and ingenuity. I also use stamps.com. They give you the ability to ship anything to anyone from anywhere. All you need is a computer and a printer and you are good to go. The hair is fear scented. I know, I know, running a business isn't cheap. I mean, unless you're selling shoes and hair that you've acquired through secret special ways. Luckily, Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts, up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. So set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code MORENEWS for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone, the little microphone guy at the top of the page and enter code more news. Yes. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Yes. Yes. Oh, so good. I, oh, hi. Sorry, I'm just jotting down some notes for my future biography. I know most rich people get there due to a great deal of luck, but as one of the rare cases it actually earned my wealth, I figured it would be good to pass along my knowledge of it. If you hear crying from the stroller, don't worry. That is normal and good. So good. Okay, back to rich people and how their warped sensibilities have incredibly troubling consequences for the rest of us normals. This is most obvious in their political power and how they manipulate our laws to ensure they will stay rich at the expense of others. I know you already know this and you don't exactly need documentation to back it up, but here is a 2013 report about how the wealthiest 1% are much more politically involved and also much more conservative than most Americans, specifically when it comes to politics around taxes, regulations, and naturally, social welfare programs. Because they're rich, you see, and so they know what's best for the poors. The paper goes on to say that the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans are even more conservative than other rich people, and that this appears to be why their opinions tend to be vastly different from what most Americans want their government to do. We could spend the rest of this episode just on that dynamic, that policymakers are heavily influenced by the super wealthy, probably because the policymakers themselves are largely members of that same group. But again, you already know this, because you're very smart and great with a sword, and we have more specific consequences of rich person behavior to dive into, like the fact that they consume way more than the rest of us, because of course they do. As of 2015, the wealthiest 10% were responsible for nearly half of the world's carbon emissions, and the top 1% emit more than twice as much carbon as the poorest half of humanity combined. The next time you feel shame for forgetting to bring your reusable bags to the grocery store, just look at an image of flight trackers after the Super Bowl. That's from 2018, and all those red lines are private jets. It was no different this year, as according to the FAA, more than 4,000 thousand additional takeoffs and landings were expected in the Phoenix area. And of course, there's a pretty good chance that two of those jets belong to these guys. Not to give away anyone's assassination coordinates, of course, but this is why it's very frustrating to talk about mitigating climate change, because it is technically about personal responsibility, except some people's responsibility matters way more than others. I think that we need to move away the focus from only individual action to a larger systemic action. Of course, we can't have system change without individual change, but still, as long as we focus on only people, for example, stop flying or becoming vegan, which is, of course, good things, but if we think that this is the way to do it, then we forget about those who are actually responsible for the climate crisis, like the multinational companies 
who are purposely destroying uh, lives and livelihoods and the planet in order to maximize short-term profits. Those are the people that we need to go after. The sad child is right! Climate activist Greta Thunberg no longer flies and has gone vegan in her personal life, but she recognizes that not all individual decisions are created equal. A manager at GameStop deciding not to fly isn't the same as, say, Elon Musk or Taylor Swift. And if corporations or the very wealthy don't do their part, then it matters way less what the rest of us do. Imagine you're on a life raft and have to consume food, and your companions were three children and also Galactus the planet eater. Yes, you should all try to conserve, but clearly one of you is the actual problem. And so it's only a matter of hours until you run out of those delicious kids. Elon supposedly thinks global warming is a major risk, but not enough to give up his private jet or to even let us see how often he's flying around in it. But in case you're wondering, his jet made 134 flights in 2022. And honestly, he's not even among the biggest offenders here. Private jets pollute five to 14 times more per passenger than commercial flying, and the industry is booming. Just between January and July of 2022, Taylor Swift's private jet flew 170 times. Please don't kill me! Okay, I think, I, I think we're okay. A spokesperson for Swift didn't dispute the numbers, but said the pop star's plane gets loaned out regularly. So, okay, cool. Glad she's a fun friend, I guess. But no matter who is in the jet, it is still responsible for nearly 1,200 times the annual emissions of the average person. Oh God, please don't hurt me! They here? They're after me? We're good. Or not? Okay, okay, well, maybe I'll hire a bodyguard in addition to the Beanie Baby Guard. I don't know. And a jet, actually. Jets are so cool. I should order a jet. <sighs> and I will. But consumption isn't the only issue. Remember that tweet of Elon saying he thought global warming was a major risk? Well, that was below his tweet where he said population collapse due to low birth rates is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. And, um... Huh? Like, in what way, Musco? He doesn't give any support for this argument or propose a solution, but I certainly wouldn't want to believe that his decision to have so many children is because he thinks the world is underpopulated, except that's literally what he said, and he is absolutely not alone in this thinking. That's right. This is a quiet but growing movement that's kind of taking off in these tech and VC circles uh, based on the idea that the human population is on the decline and especially birth rates among certain groups. And it's their job to fix that by having lots and lots of children. Gross. Also incorrect. Just to get this out of the way first, we here at the Shoddy are not anti-natalist. We may even be anti-anti-natalist in that we don't think climate change or like the state of the world are solid reasons to not have a kid. We're not pro-forced birth and we're not pro-no birth. It in fact would be great if we made it easier and less expensive to raise a child. And if you can afford to raise a child and think you'd make good parents and it would be fulfilling, et cetera, and so forth, all that good stuff, go for it. People had kids during the Black Plague. It'll be tough, but it's okay. But even more to the point, population collapse isn't happening. It just isn't. While global birth rates have declined, that's because they were pretty fucking high previously. The human population is in no danger of disappearing. We're likely to cross 10 billion people in the next 60 years, and the population might decline after that, or might not. And if it does, it'll be because of increased access to contraception and greater educational attainment among women, things like that. And yet, despite this reality, the pro-natalist movement is a growing trend among the wealthy specifically, who appear to be leading by horrifying example. Tech elites Malcolm and Simone Collins, seen here trying to invite you into a Harry Potter-themed threesome, not only want to have as many children as possible, but want their offspring to commit to having at least eight children each for 11 generations. If that happens, their bloodlines will eventually outnumber the current human population. And that's really fucking creepy, isn't it? Poor little Octavian, Torsten, and Titan Invictus, which are their fucking names, are too young to understand this, but they're apparently part of a breeding farm. They have no idea their parents have already loaned out their sperm and uteruses, your uter, uter, uteri, baby sacks, and Lord help them if they grow up not wanting to fulfill their weird destiny. But of course, while their stated motivation is this myth of a declining population, it's important to note that these pro-natalists are only pro-reproduction 
for people like them. They might not explicitly say that, but for example, here's Elon Musk praising the opening of Idiocracy that, if you recall, imagines a world where evolution is, quote, dumbed down because only poor, non-intelligent people have kids. Musk had said in interviews that the three biggest indicators for having lots of children are poverty, lack of education, and religion. So, if you're like a powerful capitalist who treats his workers poorly and views anyone who disagrees with you as a non-person and who bought an information sharing website and who has out loud said he supports the party of religious zealotry and corporate greed, one can kind of see a pretty clear picture that he seems to want to have a bunch of secret wealthy super smart babies to lead the army of poor religious misinformed masses to shape the future as he sees fit. Just a little theory based on his words and actions. Anyway, here's another much more bizarre example of tech billionaire Mark Andreessen, who's blocked me on Twitter for some reason, I don't know why, warning that chatbots and VR waifus will mean that only the most aggressive men and women will breed and send us back to the Bronze Age. Because you know, you know, you know how the best and smartest people are the ones susceptible to fucking virtual waifus? Powerful insight, Mr. Andreessen. Only a, a truly great mind could be the co-founder of Netscape, the absolutely not the first web browser ever made. Funny how these people seem to think every invention before the internet was natural selection and somehow only now are we screwing that up. And of course, there's another word for what these weird freaks are describing, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, you know, based on the very simple definition of eugenics, which is manipulating the gene pool to um, promote superior characteristics, uh, and I put that in quotation marks, that is their belief, um, that's what this is. And in fact, some of the people involved in these movements don't even deny that. They'll freely use the word eugenics. Right. They may not say it publicly in so many words, but eugenics is absolutely what we're circling here. Musk and others like him are very dedicated to the idea that wealth is directly linked to IQ, and that it's more important than ever for rich people like him to have a lot of children. So weird how an IQ test developed by a bunch of racist and wealthy eugenicists would constantly result in a bunch of pro-eugenics conclusions. So darn weird. Why? Oh, but even if IQ tests were accurate, which they aren't, it's still not true that wealthy people have higher IQs. And so none of this aligns with Elon Musk's claim that he cares about the future of humanity so much as it shows that he cares about the future of him-manity and the future of certain other people. I'm not going to call him a white nationalist, you know, for legal reasons, but there's a simple through line from Musk encouraging rich people to procreate to Victor Orban's policies aimed at promoting growth of traditional families to the Christchurch New Zealand mass shooter starting his manifesto with, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates. Again, not saying that all rich people are Nazis, Seriously, not saying that. But you see how easy it could be for a person with little consideration for others and overconfidence in their own value to conclude that their DNA must be superior and then get wrapped up in this kind of thinking, like Nazi thinking. Also, it helps if you grew up in an apartheid. But um, I'm, I'm not naming any names, all right? I'm absolutely not naming any stupid, insecure, overwhelmingly divorced names. And this creepy eugenics hogwash seems to stem from a larger ethical position known as long-termism. As the name implies, long-termism emphasizes that society should make decisions based on the long-term consequences for humanity, focusing on the lives of people generations from now, or even thousands or millions of years in the future. Okay, sure. So I assume that they think we need to prioritize the mitigation of climate change, avert nuclear war, and ensure an adequate social safety net for the long haul, right? Except it turns out that's not what they care about at all. We've talked about this before on a smaller scale because it comes up a lot when talking about tech people like Elon Musk. Invention is, as you might know, the mother of needing stuff. When Wordy McWords maker invented the first printing press, they weren't thinking about how to create the internet several thousands of years from then. Why would they? They were solving an immediate problem in their society. But something has broken in these tech people's brains where they keep trying to invent things based on what their own vision of the future should be, instead of what people actually need. Neuralink, Musk's monkey torturing company, claims it can eventually use 
brain chips to help people with disabilities. And yet, when grilled on this by a respected medical expert, Elon seems to have no idea how that would actually work. What is happening that's allowing it to do that? Like the wires, these, these small wires, yeah. are stimulating these areas of the brain. And then is it that the areas of the brain are, they're, they're losing some sort of electrical force? Like what, what is happening? Yeah. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's like, it's like the thing of just like a bunch of circuits and there's some like circuits that are broken and we can like uh, fi fix those circuits. It's a substitute for those circuits. You see, it'll like um, it'll, uh, it'll it'll shock your brain or something. Now fix it. It's like that. It's like whatever you just said to me. You guessed, and then the answer is like, yeah, it's kind of like that. Because that, of course, isn't what Musk actually created the company for. He created Neuralink because he wants to achieve a transhuman evolution where our brains are wired into the world like a computer. Oh, we can play Tetris in our minds. Neuralink's first product isn't designed to help someone with a disability, but to let us control our smartphones with brain chips. And um, do we really need that? We can already control smartphones with our voices or fingers. And there are, of course, accessibility barriers for some people regarding that. But that's not why he's doing it. He's doing it because he thinks it's like a neat little sci-fi gizmo. He's thinking about his sci-fi dream and working backwards. And because he's so hungry for that result, he's likely going to cut corners and in fact might end up achieving nothing beyond some fried monkey brains. That isn't to say brain shifts won't happen, but it will more likely be made by somebody else who is actually focused on treating the immediate need. You know, people with brain diseases or mobility issues that would be helped by a chip. And that really sums up long-termism, the idea that we need to focus on some far-off utopian fantasy to the point that we ignore or even abuse the world right in front of us. After all, what's a few dead monkeys or 1,500 other dead animals or massive worker layoffs or even a climate catastrophe when the goal is to have space colonies and immortalize the human race? And they really do fantasize about living in space. They even have a spot picked out in the form of the collection of galaxies called the Virgo Supercluster. As former long-termism adherent Emil P. Torres writes, the suffering of those living today would be minuscule compared to the potential benefit, as they see it, of having 10 to the 23rd biological humans living pleasure-filled lives throughout the Virgo supercluster. So we're clear, 10 to the 23rd is a one followed by 23 zeros. And so of course, this all ties into the breeding fantasy because to them, one of the best ways to reach that utter sci-fi nonsense is to pump out a bunch of rich kids. Swedish philosopher, Nick Bostrom, a major influence on the long-termists writes of dysgenic pressures in the current world, as in undesirable characteristics that should be bred out, quote, it is possible that advanced civilized society is dependent on there being a sufficiently large fraction of intellectually talented individuals. Currently, it seems that there is a negative correlation in some places between intellectual achievement and fertility. He goes on to say that genetic engineering is rapidly approaching the point where it will become possible to give parents the choice of endowing their offspring with genes that correlate with intellectual capacity, physical health, longevity, and other desirable traits. Always great when someone talks about desirables and undesirables. In short, these are people who watched Gattaca and completely misunderstood the message of it. I'm not editorializing. I'm not saying this just so we can show you that sick poster. Quote from that pronatalist couple, the Collinses. We are the underground railroad of Gattaca babies and people who want to do genetic stuff with their kids. Literally name dropping the cautionary film Gattaca as their goal. It really can't be stressed enough how unself-aware they are about any of this, as when asked about the pronatalist movement, Malcolm Collins told the National Post, imagine if there really were some secret cabals of rich dudes trying to just make more of themselves. Wouldn't that be outrageous and wild? Ah, yes, wouldn't that be wild? These weird rich freaks want to give their offspring a major genetic edge to populate the earth and then go infest some far off super cluster. It's literal galaxy brain stuff that some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world subscribe to. Elon directly parroted the idea that rich people tend to have fewer kids and he's given $1.5 million to Bostrom's Future of Humanity Institute, which also counts among its supporters, hedge fund manager Luke Ding and secretive venture capitalist Alexander Thomas. Bostrom's papers, existential 
existential risks and astronomical waste focus on the potential future value of humanity and how that value is tied to technologically manipulating the human body to enhance ourselves physically and eliminate aging if you can afford it. You come away from these papers with the unmistakable realization that those who accept this stuff don't see a ton of value in the lives currently being lived. They don't care about humanity. They care about their idea of the potential future of their chosen humanity. They think that we are, once again, NPCs in their world. In fact, the Collinses have a different term for it. They call them husks, as in, quote, we call them a husk because when someone halts the process of creative destruction, refusing to explore, weigh, and sometimes to accept new ideas, they stop being meaningfully human, in our house's view at least. Cool quote from demons. But to be fair and balanced, you know, after all, if you were dealt such a statistically and probably good hand, it would be really hard not to think you were the main character, even to the point that you might start believing that you are living in a simulation just for you. We like to pretend we're talking about eccentric traits here. But how is this not a serious delusion? One that is really dangerous when you think about how much power these people have. If you got on a plane and the pilot announced that nothing mattered because everyone is living in the matrix, you'd probably have some safety concerns. These people have, for the most part, given up on our current civilization and are preparing for the next one, which incidentally also belongs to them. For example, there's Project Eureka, a startup town the Collinses tried to raise money for during the pandemic, where all community rules would be ultimately set, all disputes resolved by them. In fact, they flat out say they don't care about poor people or improving people's baseline in order to lift everyone up. If you want to make the future better for everyone, and you could choose to dramatically increase the educational outcomes of the bottom 10% of people, or the top 0.1% of people, spoiler alert, they say choose the 0.1%. They also claim to be secular Calvinists, hopefully completely unrelated to scientific Calvinism, which is, you know, Nazi shit, but no holding my breath on that. It seems like maybe it's like pretty much the exact same thing, and at that point it's a semantic game, so maybe that's what they're saying it is. And they do say it's not cultural or racial, but they're also concerned about demographic collapse. So, a family of contradictions, I guess, is my point. It's this self-fulfilling prophecy where they think society is doomed, and in turn, they do nothing to help society, often even hurting it and showing contempt for those who make up society. And after doing their best to ruin civilization, many among the super-rich are hoping to escape its collapse, preparing for doomsday scenarios by purchasing private islands or securing an underground bunker with a fully gassed-up helicopter ready to go. Many rich survivalists refer to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as foolishly expecting meaningful aid and believe they, the venture capitalists and hedge fund managers, should be the ones who survive and rule after, uh, well, take your pick. Steve Hoffman, the co-founder and CEO of Reddit, credits the 1998 film Deep Impact with turning him into a doomsday prepper. His plan for a disaster is to gravitate to other people. But he phrases that by saying, quote, being around other people is a good thing. I also have this somewhat egotistical view that I'm a pretty good leader. I will probably be in charge or at least not a slave when push comes to shove. OK, so if you're not in charge, you won't be a slave. But if you are in charge, will there still be slaves? Very interesting that he sounds kind of excited for an apocalypse and automatically assumes there will be leaders and slaves in that scenario. Winners and losers, with him, of course, being on the right side of that equation. That's what the idea of community means to him. And this knucklehead's not even a billionaire. He's worth a f***ing pathetic $10 million, according to a website that makes up how much money they think people have. The doomsday prepping is a good example of the uncomfortable amount of sci-fi fantasizing among the wealthy that conveniently isolates them from disgusting commoners. Funny how that's always the end result. Elon Musk was inspired to start a whole tunnel digging company just so he personally wouldn't have to deal with traffic anymore. And as an afterthought said, he'd sell his leftover dirt for poor people's houses. And of course, 
He has to frame it as a, a practical solution and not a selfish one. We often see this with all these billionaires trying to go to space, apparently just to feel something. But when asked to justify private space travel, they often give answers like this. What would you say to those people who say that this is a misuse of resources? Well, I can, un I can understand it, but I think maybe they d they're not fully educated as to what space does for Earth. Um, what, do what does it do for Earth? Uh, well, first of all, people wouldn't be listening to this program if it mo most likely if it wasn't for space. Um, space it, it, it is connecting the billions of people who are not connected, you know, on, the, on telephones, on, on uh, other, uh, other things. Oh, okay. So we're not educated enough to understand it. it. Says the guy whose big success was opening up the record store you'd go to when your mom was taking too long at Nordstrom. But what Richard Branson is pointing out is that the push for space travel, usually a government funded situation, often creates or improves modern technology. And he's not wrong, except that's not why he's going to space, is it? His company is promoting space tourism for rich people starting at $450,000 a ticket. That magnanimous, profound explanation has nothing to do with what his space company is doing. Maybe, you know, maybe they will make some amazing and helpful technological discoveries while trying to pump their billionaire passengers full of teenager blood, but that's not why they're doing it. Guys like Jeff Bezos try to justify this, saying that while critics of billionaire space travel are mostly right, he still thinks it's important to look to the future as a species and as a civilization. Again, they don't really know how their specific space projects will help our immediate needs in a practical way. It's just like vibes for them. In Star Trek, they're in space. Therefore, to get to a Star Trek future, we need to be in space. It doesn't matter if there are a million steps to do first or problems we have that we shouldn't be bringing to space. And of course, what that really means is that they want to be in space. They can't just say that, so they have to pretend like there's a selfless reason they're doing this. And look, I know that we're talking about the extremes here. Not all rich people are this far gone. Larry David isn't out here dreaming about injecting his essence into a cyborg body on Rigel 4, even though he's the first who should be doing that. But I think we've shown that in general, greater wealth leads to greater self-focus and isolation from community. And as a person gets deeper in that hole, their beliefs get more and more skewed, not towards like smartness or whatever, but towards gnarled, anti-social, anti-human dystopian beliefs. As wealth inequality widens, this is only going to get worse. And as we've already mentioned, this could happen to anyone. It's almost, it's almost as if, and just, just stick with me on this, it's almost as if this is a health problem. It's almost as if being ridiculously wealthy does something to your brain that is bad, the same way any addiction could be bad. And while I'm not exactly saying we need to feel sorry for rich people, we do kind of need to feel some compassion for this, you know? Because that's the only way to fix it. And we do need to fix it. Because this health problem affects everybody. These people are controlling our lives. These people. are controlling our lives. Of course, I'm not exactly sure how to actually address this as a health crisis, which it is. The GOP loves to say they're concerned about people with mental health problems having access to guns, even though they don't actually care about that. But perhaps we should do the same with rich people's access to lawmakers. For example, we should overturn the enabler that is Citizens United. Democrats are already trying to do that, so I'm sure it'll happen any day now. Then maybe if they don't have as much influence, we can talk about a public health approach to the issue. Encourage the ultra wealthy to give up most of their money and or make it harder for the super rich to passively generate more wealth. Maybe a cap on the amount of wealth they are allowed to accumulate so as to not irrevocably break their brains and our society. You know, cut them off. Maybe they've had enough. 
The Institute for Policy Studies says that many billionaires who pledged to give away the majority of their money were unable to do so because their assets simply grew too fast. Even Mackenzie Scott, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, isn't able to give her money away fast enough, and she's donated $14 billion to more than 1,600 nonprofits in just a span of four years. They literally can't cure themselves of this if they try, and so they clearly need help right? I know I'm being a little cheeky here, but considering that the other proposed alternative is that we eat the rich, this is actually quite compassionate. Like in a zombie film, you try to find a cure first, and we could still try to find a cure for the money disease that all rich people have, except for me, you know, the only good rich person, Cody Johnston. And who knows, maybe I can really turn things around for rich people everywhere by setting a good example. So what's important then is that I stay rich, obviously, as one of the good rich people, that's very important. And I owe it all to hard work, a superior brain, the beard, obviously, and of course, this beanie baby that I earned through what is going on? Beanie booze? This isn't a beanie baby at all. It's a worthless plush garbage doll. Oh, oh my. Oh my God, I'm ruined. Oh my God, I already bought six boats on my credit card. Oh, fuck, what am I gonna do? That stroller toddler tricked me. That I'm going to sue. I'm going to sue the toddler. I'm going to sue the parents. I'm going to sue the president of the United States. I'm going to sue all of you. Then I'm going to get a federal bailout and be fine because I'm rich and I've earned it. And I'm a job creator. Okay. Crisis averted. Phew. That was close. I, I almost lost control there. Okay. Time to celebrate with a new boat. Yes, one boat, please. Don't worry, folks, I figured it out. I'm gonna take all the stuff that I bought when I thought I was rich, and I, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm do street magic. Oh, whoa, it's a, a, a live fox I pulled out of this fucking hat. Okay, make sure to like and subscribe so I can pay off all of my debts. And check out our patreon.com slash some more news. We've also got a podcast called Even More News. And this show is a podcast. It's called Some More News. You can check it out if you want to listen instead of what you just did. We got a merch store with merchandise. And sometimes Warmbo is on that merchandise. Other times he's not. And although he has touched every product, so there's a little bit of warm bow and everything. Um, you know what? That's the end. That's all I have to say. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. We wanted to get Mark Cuban for this and he responded to me, but he said he was too busy. So he's interested. Next time. See you later, Mark. Who is definitely watching this. Friend of the show.